but let's get into it. Silly question. No headphones. Yeah. Only because, well, so you're not allowed, what you're not allowed to do, and I think this is already stated in the syllabus, but you're not allowed to access to audio during the exam. And I can't allow headphones because some people might not own ed headphones, so it's an advantage to some and a disadvantage to others. So just blanket statement, no audio during the exam. Thank you for asking, not a silly question. So we're trying to finish up today genotyping, PCR, agarose gel electrophoresis. That's fine. Why do we care about the ability to genotype and the ability to do PCR, polymerase chain reaction? I showed, starting last class, this idea that we can color code chromosomes and see how they're inherited and transmitted from generation to generation which sounds a lot like classical genetics, which it is. It's all about, <coughs> well, I hate to say Mendel because I'm going to say Mendel and then everyone's going to roll their eyes or well, Mendel again. But this was the start of transmission genetics. That's a huge part of genetics is understanding how traits and how DNA are passed from generation to generation. To be able to do that, we have to be able to track the chromosomes from generation to generation. We have to be able to do something like color coding. Of course, and as I mentioned last class, the way we do that is by zooming in and actually looking at the sequence of the chromosomes. That's how we distinguish one chromosome from the same chromosome. Here's, for example, an individual that has, is that the same sequence or two different sequences? It's the same. So I've color-coded both of these chromosomes blue because they're blue. They're the maternal version of the chromosome. And if we look at the red chromosomes, A-T-A-G-A-T-T, -A -A -T, they're both the same sequence. What's the term we use, use for this? These are the blue and the red chromosomes all together are homologous chromosomes. It's all ver versions of the same chromosome. We could call this chromosome three if you want, just for fun. That's just an arbitrary choice on my part, chromosome three. Okay. So how do I know that the blue copy came from the mom and the red copy came from the dad? So that's the color code I used, but how did I know there's a sequence difference? Which now is hard to see because I haven't blown it up as much. But to be able to compare the red and the blue chromosomes. Yeah, there's a difference between the two and the third base pair. Right? The blue version has a C. The red version has an A. That sequence difference lets me know that I can distinguish the two chromosomes when they're combined, as here, in the kit. You get one chromosome from your mom, one from your dad. So this gets at another important vocabulary item from last class that we didn't talk about yet, but should be review. When you've got two copies of the red chromosome, what do we call that? There's, their chromosomes are sister chromatids depending on which part of the cell cycle. But those two chromosomes, are they identical in sequence or different in sequence? They're both, the identical. They're, they both have identical sequence. You can see it up there if you zoom in. The two red chromosomes have exactly the same DNA sequence. The same is true for dad. right? Dad's got two red chromosomes. Mom's got two blue chromosomes. The kid is. What's the term for when you've got two different sequences? You're heterozygous. Hetero meaning other. Zygous meaning something about a zygote, something about fertilization. So what that means is there was a blue gamete. There was 
a different hetero or other gamete that were combined to make the zygote. There's a difference. By contrast, mom herself, <coughs> by virtue of having the same chromosome, two, two blue chromosome threes, those chromosomes are not heterozygous, but homozygous. Okay. So <coughs> vocabulary you've maybe heard a lot. So the dad is homozygous, the mom is homozygous. When we zoom in on the kid, hopefully there's actually a sequence difference here or I screwed something up. Is the kid heterozygous? Is there a DNA sequence difference? You're right, yeah, the A versus C. Otherwise, the two sequences are identical, but there's a difference. That's how we know there's a red chromosome and a blue chromosome, that there are two different chromosomes there. We have to know the sequence. And that has entirely to do with the importance and the relevance of genotyping. The process of genotyping is determining the sequence of chromosomes. There are many ways to do it. One of them is DNA sequencing. You extract some of these DNA, you actually read out the sequence of the letters, like shown here in this graphic. But DNA sequencing is kind of expensive, so there are a lot of less expensive ways to do genotyping to determine the DNA sequences between chromosomes. And that has entirely to do with PCR and agarose gel electrophoresis. Ah, in case you don't believe me, which you shouldn't necessarily, I asked my Twitterverse. I didn't get many responses. I did a poll yesterday, 16 votes. But you can see what I asked people. If you run a research lab like I do, if you consider, so I'm asking faculty basically. If you run a research lab that you consider at least partly to be a genetics lab, how frequently do your students use PCR? Right. 16 people responded, nobody never has anybody do PCR. So PCR is prevalent. That's why I'm taking time in class to talk about it. This is genetics. If there's anything that's a genetics technique that you should know about, it's PCR. Polymerase chain reaction. Ways to make loads and loads and loads and loads and millions and billions of copies of DNA for the purpose of genotyping, for the purpose of figuring out the sequence of a chromosome. There's a lot of vocabulary up here. Don't stress out. We're going to talk about a lot of it today. Not necessarily all of it, but almost all of it. And here are the tasks. We've already done a couple of these. We've already started working on homozygosity and heterozygosity. We've talked about alleles already. That was last class, talking about different repeats of microsatellite units, those allele frequency tables. That whole thing we did last class. So right now, basically, we're left with PCR and agarose gel electrophoresis. And while I'm here, another way to study for the exam, you might recall, you might not recall, at the start of the semester, I mentioned that for every topic, I've put out for you this list of tasks things that you should be able to do by the time we get to the exam. This is basically a generic exam. So look back at all the topics, all the chapters in the manual, they have a list of things that you should be able to do in that chapter. It's a great study guide for practicing for the exam. Right? Not specific questions, but things you should be able to do. So it'd be good to review that before Tuesday study session, review session and ask questions about any tasks you have questions about. OK. Last thing before we get to gels and PCR, Socrative quiz from last class. So haplotypes and genotypes, always confusing. I'm not going to show you the answers from class, but these were definitely, there was a mixed bag of answers to these. 
So here are the answers. For C, T, and G, A, which is a haplotype? G, A is a haplotype. And C, T is a haplotype. For C, T over G, A, which is a genotype, C over G, C slash G is a genotype. That's it. Ah, so if there was, good point, if there was a D here and it was T slash A, that would also be correct. So this is all to do with nomenclature, so I want to talk briefly about the nomenclature and about what it actually means to be a haplotype and a genotype. That's the goal. Two goals today. This is one, then we get to agarose gel electrophoresis, PCR. So what do, what do we use when we write out a genotype? There's a specific character that we use, symbol, for haplotypes and genotypes. The genotype is very much like what we just looked at when we were looking at dad, mom, and offspring. I don't remember which letters were unique to the red chromosomes and the blue chromosomes. You could probably tell me if you want to, but I'll just make up new ones. So let's say the red chromosome had T's and the blue chromosome had A's. And so the kid, the offspring, was a heterozygote, we said, isn't the same at this spot on this chromosome. We've got different nucleotides. So what, how would we write the genotype of the kid? The genotype is simply a description of at one spot on one chromosome, or at multiple spots on multiple chromosomes, the composition of the two chromosomes, the nucleotides. T slash A. So we literally write T slash A, thank you. The slash, as you saw, this is from one of those little videos that were on the QR codes last class. Hopefully you went back and watched all of the videos, not just the one that you watched for your group. If you didn't go back and watch all three of those videos, I suggest doing it. The slash indicates what? It represents something. It's the, yeah, it's physically separate. We're talking about the nucleotide on one chromosome, one piece of DNA, and the nucleotide that's on the other double helix. That's what a slash represents. It separates physical pieces of genetic material, double helices. So that is a genotype. I want to contrast that with an example of a haplotype. And what have I drawn here on the left side? So the, the top two chromosomes, I'm still color coding by parent. So the colors, the reds and the blues, represent the parent of origin. So what am I circling here? Homologous chromosomes. Homologous chromosomes. So these are both, for example, again, say that's chromosome three. And down here we've got a smaller chromosome, so we'll call that chromosome 19. When you look in a gamete, if that cell went through meiosis, you might have this combination of chromosomes. You're going to have one red chromosome that's got a T, 
you're going to have, sorry, that's chromosome 3. Chromosome 19, you've got a G. Sorry, I had to make the chromosomes smaller. Those gametes are tiny. That's a haplotype. That's a combination of DNA sequences that are on the they're on different chromosomes usually. They could be on the same chromosome, but it's the, what is representing the sequence on multiple chromosomes in one cell that's a gamete. So this sperm has a TG haplotype, and we write that with the semicolon. Can I yes. Absolutely. So ultimately, haplo comes from haploid, meaning half, haplo, half. So it's basically half of a genotype. Normally, and I suggest certainly that you go look up textbook definitions of haplotype as well. But in my thinking, the easiest way to explain it is it's a combination uh, within one individual of the DNA sequence is present at multiple loci or multiple genes in their sperm or in their egg, depending on whether or not you're talking about a male or a female. So maybe a better way to demonstrate what I mean by a haplotype is to look at a complex situation. And then draw it out. So we'll start with, two, with a genotype. We'll break it down into the genotype and the haplotype components, which is what that Socrative question was all about, right? From this sort of a situation, what's a genotype and what's a haplotype? So let's review. The slashes mean what? Slashes represent separation between physical objects. And the semicolons? Semicolons represent different chromosomes. So that would be, for example, on the right, we might be talking about chromosome 3. The number on the left, we might be talking about chromosome 1. So we're talking about different homologous chromosomes being separated by semicolons. We're talking about different sister chromatids or versions of the same chromosome number when we're talking about slashes. So there are two copies of chromosome 1 and two copies of chromosome 3. What this means is that there's a T at one spot on chromosome 1, and there's an A next to it, somewhere on that same piece of DNA. That's what the T and the A next to each other with no punctuation between them means. Right, two nucleotides that are different spots on the chromosome, but it's the same physical piece of material. So the TA are next to each other on one piece of DNA, same there. The slash means now we look at the other sister chromatid. So what am I going to write on it? There's a G and then an A. Physically linked together, next to each other with no punctuation in the actual genotype, what's written at the top of the screen. So the genotype, 
What's, one, what's a genotype of this case on the left? TG, T slash G is the genotype that whatever gene that is. Okay, homozygous or heterozygous? It's heterozygous because there's a difference. Yeah. Right, so I'm ignoring a lot of base pairs that are not shown, usually because they're identical. But in this case, I'm highlighting. So at the bottom, we've got an A slash A genotype, homozygous. So I'm just using this as an example for working through the vocabulary. But yeah, nor a lot of times we don't care if it's a homozygosity because that's what we expect generally between chromosomes. After all, every one of us is 99.9% .9 identical in sequence. So if we wrote out all of the homozygous genotypes, then we'd spend most of our lives doing that. So then what would I write on this smaller chromosome? If I put the T, G, T there, where's the G going? Next to it or below it? Because the T and the G are next to each other on one side of the slash, which means one piece of DNA. So the T and the G are next to each other on one chromatid. And the T and the A are next to each other on the other. So again, we have one case of homozygosity, one case of heterozygosity. Another way to think about this, looking up at that top line, is that genotypes compare those nucleotides. They're written in order left to right. Here, T comes first and then G on one molecule of DNA and then a T followed by an A on the other. So when I was asking that Socrative question about when I show you a complex genotype like this, which one is an individual locus genotype? It would be the T with the T, like we drew down here, homozygous, and a G with an A, that's heterozygous. So that's homozygosity, heterozygosity, and genotypes and haplotypes. So in this case, each thing that's on one side of the slash is a haplotype. Haplotype represents what's on one piece of DNA. Genotype represents the sequences on the two homologous chromosomes. How do we annotate uh, genes that are multiple base pairs? So this, yeah, so it's a good question. How do you, what do you do when you're talking about multiple genes? You could consider that these chromosomes, as I drew them, are actually, that could be one gene. So we know that a single gene could be hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of base pairs long. It will have multiple heterozygous locations across it. So you can rock, write out a haplotype that involves multiple loci within a gene, and it looks okay. exactly the same. Yeah. So it's, they, it's a matter of scale. Right. Are they numbered, or how does that? I mean, sorry, just. Yeah. Normally, them. you would number these according to the which we'll get to more when we talk about transcription and translation, but we talk about numbering within the gene. Okay. Yeah. We've already talked about homozygote and heterozygote. Excellent. So any questions at this point? How many questions? Not just any. I know there are. There will be examples of this on the mock exam to help practice. Talk about homozygosity, heterozygosity, haplotypes, genotypes. Oh, 
how to PCR and gel electrophoresis then. And we're going to wind up, if you can look ahead, of course, you'll see that most of this is going to be reserved for the exercises that we've done in class or I've asked you to prepare for class. We're going to talk about how to answer them. The critical thing is just to be complete, because you took this Socrative quiz last class, I want you to know what the answers are to the questions. PCR and DNA replication. Basically, PCR, what we're doing DNA replication in the laboratory. My students do PCR all the time. And I hope some of you will come join me and do some PCR in my laboratory. Honestly. Both involve replication of DNA. The whole point of PCR is to make extra copies of DNA so that we can analyze them in the laboratory. So yes, DNA is synthesized. That's the whole point of PCR. It's exactly the same as DNA replication. And yes, we in the laboratory use the same thing that we use in our cells to make those copies of DNA. We use the same enzyme DNA polymerase. However, the difference between PCR, or one difference between PCR and DNA replication is A. So in which case, is it DNA replication in our cells or is it PCR? Which case where A is true, an enzyme breaks the hydrogen bonds that separate the two strands? That's DNA replication. <coughs> Helicase. In PCR, when we do this in the laboratory, we don't bother because there's an easier way to break two strands of DNA apart so they can be replicated, which would be heat. Exactly. So instead of buying a $200 tube of like 20 microliters of helicase from some company somewhere else, we just heat up the DNA sample, hydrogen bonds break, we proceed with DNA replication. Most of you got question six right, so I'm not going to go into great deal. We're going to go through how to design primers in just a minute, but it's where we scientists design the primers to anneal on the template strands of DNA that define how much DNA we replicate using the PCR technique. And we'll look at that in detail. This next question is boring. It's just a vocabulary question. Two chromosomes differ in length. You can distinguish them by AFLP. Don't worry about it. I hate questions about vocabulary. I shouldn't have even put that on there. But you should. It would be useful for you to go back. If you don't know the difference between A and R, go back and revisit that concept. There's, there's a difference between an AFLP and an RFLP that's useful to know. Okay. The most important thing for today is question eight. And most of you got this right. So how does agarose gel electrophoresis work? You have this piece of jello, basically, three-dimensional. And it has little depressions in it that we call wells. And we can pipette DNA samples into those wells. And we apply electrical charge. This is just a review from the video. We apply an electrical charge. So the DNA starts up here at the top inside the wells. There's a liquid solution. And then we pull it through the gel based on electric What's DNA's charge? Positive or negative? negative? Negative. It's phosphate groups on the backbone. So DNA is going to move, DNA itself is negatively charged. So it's going to move towards the positive end of the gel. I'm really bad at drawing arrows, apparently. So that has to do with which of those four options. 
well, D, charge. charge. There's one other correct answer there. So here's, yeah, so this is where I think, I couldn't tell from the Socrative results because it records all of your, everyone could choose multiple choices, so it was hard to tell who chose what, the combination of answers. Three-dimensional structure. It's all double-stranded DNA. There's no difference between the molecules that are moving through the gel. So shouldn't there be no difference in charge? So there shouldn't be, so here's, so three-dimensional structure doesn't change. So now we're down to A and B. Is it nucleotide composition? Well, every nucleotide has the same charge. Every nucleotide has a phosphate group, and that phosphate group has a negative charge. So there's no difference between nucleotide composition. It doesn't matter if it's all A's or all T's or all G's or all C's. So it's length. Why length? So charge is important. We're separating by charge. All the DNA is going to be pulled down to the positive pole. But the point of agarose gel electrophoresis, which hopefully you remember from the video, is we're separating the DNA so we can see the sizes of the DNA products. The way this works, and this is the most confusing thing. I've already seen some incorrect answers, which is not surprising. This happens all the time. Where do the bigger molecules of DNA go versus the smaller molecules? If there's anything to remember about agarose gel electrophoresis, this is going to be it. If you're a big molecule of DNA and you get loaded in the well, do you go farther faster or do you go slower? slower? You go slower because basically you're a ginormous molecule and you're trying to be pulled. Did I say ginormous? You're trying to be pulled by electricity through this jello. If you're a little tiny DNA molecule, you find your way through the holes in between the jello, the agarose gel, a lot more easily. There's less resistance. So the smaller pieces of DNA go to the bottom of the gel in a faster amount of time than the big molecules. So length and charge. Charge is essential just to get this process to work, to pull DNA through the gel. But what separates the different sizes of DNA is their size. So you have to have an electric field, and then after that, small pieces of DNA go farther through the gel than the big pieces of DNA. To get, we're going to come back to agarose gel electrophoresis in a little bit. But before we get there, we need to actually generate those pieces of DNA we're going to load into the gel and separate them on size. So this was one of the exercises. I've had a number of conversations with a few of you about how to solve this. So speaking, for those of you that want to know, if you see a question on an exam and you don't know where to start, where, what's the best way to start this answer? Yeah, go for the, go for the central 10 base pairs. So I'm going to count. This is 30 base pairs long. I hope I did that correctly. Looks good. There's the central 10 base pairs. We want to amplify those base pairs, just that piece of DNA. That's the point of PCR. You pick which part of the chromosome you want to make lots of copies of. There's our target. My suggestion to you, by the way, here's an answer from one of your submissions to that exercise via Google Classroom. This is correct. So you've got one example. This is the answer. And we're going to work through how to get to this answer. So this is exactly in the format I'd like. 
What they've done here is they've bolded those central 10 nucleotides, and then they provided the sequences of two primers from five prime to three prime. So that was important, labeling the polarity of the primer sequences. Asked for two primer sequences, five nucleotides long, they got delivered. So how do we get there? That's what we're doing. My suggestion, the very first thing you should do when you see a question like the question that was posed, here's the sequence of one strand of DNA, design some primers, write the complementary strand. Bless you. Everybody's allergic to PCR. So the strand on top was the one I gave in the original question. Here's a sequence of DNA designed primers to amplify it. All I've done here is I've written out the complementary sequence. And I've underlined the central 10 bit squares. <laughs> See? OK. Now, PCR primers are just like the primers that primase creates during DNA replication. DNA polymerase, remember, is the same enzyme that is used in our cells that we use in PCR to make the new molecules of DNA. It has exactly the same rules. It requires exactly the same things. So what does DNA polymerase need to start synthesizing a new strand? It's got a, it needs a template, which we have now. So we have two template molecules, both in black. They're hydrogen bonds, which I'm not drawing the number of hydrogen bonds for each nucleotide, but they're hanging out there in space, ready to hydrogen bond with either the other template strand or a primer that we've designed that we've stuck in this tube with the template. What else does DNA polymerase need besides that template molecule? Yes. A three-prime nucleotide, the hydroxyl, to grab onto and start adding nucleotides onto. So the question is, where is that going to be for the top strand? Where along here, underneath, where the hydrogen bonds are ready to base pair with a primer, where here do we want to have that three prime end so that we synthesize that copy, make the second strand of that underlying segment? Where's the three prime end going to be? Here on the right or here on the left? To the left, to the right. Well, it's going to be anti parallel. The primer is going to be pointing the opposite direction as the template strand. So if the template strand is the three prime end on the right, then the primer's five prime end is going to be somewhere here, which means it's three prime end that needs to be pointing into the spot we're going to copy. That free three prime end, RNA, DNA polymerase is going to grab onto and start synthesizing. It has to be over there on the right. And it has to be complementary in sequence. So if you wanted to make, for example, a five nucleotide long primer, That would be its sequence from 5 prime to 3 prime. So reading it from right to left, 5 prime to 3 prime, G, A, T, C, G. That would base pair with the template strand. And then there'd be that 3 prime end, RNA polymerase would grab onto that 3 prime end. It would start moving this direction. It would incorporate an A, and then a T, and a C, and a G, complementary to the top strand template, and it would keep going. So we're synthesizing the second strand of this template. We're copying, we're making, we're replicating DNA. So five prime G, A, T, C, G. We'll synthesize the complementary strand of the top template strand. So that's one primer. Now we need the second primer.
Where's the second primer going to go? We have two templates. One double helix. That was the split into two templates. And those are the two black sequences up there, the initial two template strands. We've already got the second strand of the top template going. What do we need to do to get replication on the bottom strand? It needs to be a primer that's going the opposite direction. Very good. So it's five prime ends going to be over here. Three prime end will be up here somewhere. So where are we going to position that primer? Right before the G. So again, if we decided we wanted to make a five nucleotide primer, it would be complementary. There. GCTAT. And it's three prime end there is where there would be an RNA polymerase. You say there's a three prime hydroxyl, bind there, and start adding in the new DNA nucleotides. And so forth to the right. So now I've gone from one double helix to two. The initial double helix I didn't show, that was the two black strands, the template strands, when they were annealed to each other. We heated them up. We broke them apart to create two template strands. And now we've done one round of PCR. We've gone from one double helix which looked like that. We heated it up, triangle. We made single-strand templates. And then we got replication of the second strand. So now we've gone from one double helix to two. Now we've got four template strands. So we heat those up. We get four template strands. One double helix to two, from two double helices to four. 4 to 8, 8 to 16, 16 to 32, exponential growth. And in 25 to 30 cycles, we've got literally billions of molecules of this part of the chromosome. The most important thing to notice about this, of course, is look here. The sequence of that primer and the sequence of that primer where else are they? Where, where do you find those? They're identical in sequence and polarity to the other strand. It's a good way to double check yourself. And that's because the second strand, the other template strand, just like a primer, has to be complementary in sequence and anti-parallel in orientation. <laughs> My goodness, I better stop talking about PCR. <laughs> okay, so there's, there's an important, thank you very much. How long of a piece of DNA so you're absolutely right. I'm glad you pointed that out. This is what I was thinking I was asking when I wrote this question. It turned out the answer that I showed you on the slide before this one, the student response, was a more correct answer than this. This is what I was thinking when I designed this. But how long of a piece of DNA will this create? How many nucleotides long? It's going to be, as in that Socrative quiz, it's defined by the distance between the primers, including the primers themselves, because they become incorporated. They're DNA primers, not RNA, like in replication. These are DNA primers. They become incorporated into the final product. So this winds up producing 20 nucleotides. What the problem is, is that now, not only have I replicated the part in between them, that's the 10 nucleotides that we were aiming for. But 
those primers also add five nucleotides on that side and five nucleotides on that side. So really, this is a 20 nucleotide piece of DNA. OK. So time to apply. Sir, first, yeah. So where are these two sequences, chromosome 1 from dad, 1p, chromosome 1 from mom? Where are they heterozygous? OK. So I hear the ninth nucleotide. It's the only place where the two chromosomes have a difference in this tiny little stretch of chromosome. All right. So now. How would you start answering the second question? It's the first thing you should do. Write the second strand. And on your next slide for you. I know I shouldn't do the work for you, but I couldn't help it. So it's these top strands that were the original two that I gave on that previous slide. So now I've just added in the complementary strands underneath them. So you can see what the paternal double-stranded DNA sequence would look like up here and the maternal version down here. So now we have to design primers to amplify this piece of DNA. What do you think? If you want to amplify this whole section of DNA, where are the primers going to start? Let's look at the top strand. 1P, 5 prime on the left, 3 prime on the right. Where is the primer going to have to be to copy, to make, to synthesize, to replicate the bottom, the second strand? Well, it's going to have a 5 prime polarity on the right and a 3 prime on the left. So you, are we going to have the primer on the right side or the left side? The, primer on the, right. the right side. Because that means its 3 prime end will be positioned where DNA polymerase can finish replication towards the left. How long do you want the primer to be? Make it up. Pick a number. Four. four? Okay. So we'll make it four nucleotides long. So A, 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 T. Okay. Good. We've designed a primer. That's a good answer. There are other answers. You could make it longer. You have A, 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 T, T, T if you want. What about the other strand? This strand. Where are we going to put the primer that's going to copy that? The left side or the right side? It's going to be the opposite. It's going to be the left side. And the sequence will be you can decide how long you want to make it. It doesn't have to be four nucleotides. Again, we know that that's anti-parallel, so it's five prime on the left, three prime on the right. And again, RNA polymerase, DNA polymerase comes in and binds those three prime ends and synthesizes the second strands. I want to make it very clear that I made a poor choice of sequence here. It is not usually the case that the two primers will have the same sequence. That's just an artifact of this particular question. You'll notice they both, from five prime to three prime, the sequences are the same, AAAT. That's just because of the sequence I chose, the template strand. Usually, they're going to be different sequences, the two primers. And these can both be used for the maternal strand as well, which is usually the case. We want the primers to be able to amplify both of the strands at the same time, both of the sister chromatids, both of the chromosomes, the paternal version and the maternal version. 
So if we do this, once replication is complete, this is what we've got. And I know you love me watch out writing complementary strands as much as I like writing them, but this is going to be useful for the next thing we have to do. So the next step, what was the next part of that question? We designed primers. We identified the heterozygosity. We designed primers. How long did we amplify? Okay, so how long a piece of DNA did we replicate? And that we basically answered the principle in the previous question, which was that it's the primers plus everything that's in between them. So how many nucleotides long are those? Eighteen nucleotides. So we've made a bunch of copies of an 18 base pair long piece of DNA. There. So in total, that's 18 base pairs. So now we've got billions of copies of mom's chromosome, 18 base pairs of it, and the same for dad's chromosome from one individual. What's the next part of that question? 10 minutes. We've got 10 minutes left. We've got to finish the question. Small one. Okay, so we're going to run a gel with these DNA samples, but first, the, what this question is asking is something about small one. Did anybody Google small one? What is small one, do you think? It's an endonuclease. We've talked about restriction enzymes before. So small one is a restriction enzyme. What do restriction enzymes do? Yeah, right. So good things to review for the exam. Restriction enzymes recognize double-stranded DNA sequences that are usually palindromes. It means they read the same backwards and forwards. And so you should be able to Google, if you saw this on an exam, the first thing I would do is Google small one, find out what DNA sequence it recognizes. So what's its DNA sequence? Small one recognizes CCCGGG, which is here, not surprisingly, because I put it in the question on purpose. Here's a CCCGGG palindrome right in the middle of this piece of DNA. That's 18 base pairs long. We already agreed on that. So what's going to happen, by the way, notation. When you look up something about how a restriction enzyme cuts, it will usually indicate, the result will indicate where it cuts with a little caret, or whatever you want to call that exponent key. It's a caret, a little upward pointing V or a downward pointing V. So small one cuts in between the C and the G in that six base pair sequence when it sees it. So we've got an 18 base pair amplicon from dad. If we treat that 18 nucleotide piece of DNA with small one, if we add the enzyme, what's going to happen? Yes. And we're not going to worry about the blunts right now, but um, yes, that was in the video. I'm not going to concentrate on that for exam material. But there are two different types of enzymes. They have sticky ends or blunt ends. This is a blunt cutter. And so small one will cut dad's chromosome where it recognizes that sequence, CCCGGG. It's going to cut it in between the C's and the G's. So that's going to produce not one molecule of DNA, but two of, as you said, sir, equal length. So we're going to get a nine base pair fragment and a nine base pair fragment. when we treat this DNA with this enzyme. Is the same true for what 
mom's chromosome looks like? No, because she doesn't have, there's a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism. She's different. She's heterozygous. That heterozygosity means she does not have the small one recognition site. She's got CCG, GGG, which is not something that small one would bind to and cut. So when we add small one, the enzyme to mom's DNA sample, what happens? Nothing. So we wind up getting an 18 base pair piece of DNA. Yep, one long piece of, nothing happens. So the last thing we have to do is gel electrophoresis. We put these samples into the gel. We're going to have, let's see. Indeed. We're going to have different samples that either have, have plus or don't have minus small one. So what's the size of DNA we get when we add the uncut dad, 1P with no small one minus? That piece of DNA is 18 nucleotides long. So it's going to run and form a band on this gel of a certain size. 18 nucleotides goes, it's a pretty small piece of DNA, goes pretty quickly through that agarose gel towards the positive end. And in the absence of small one, what do you predict the chromosome one from mom looks like? We haven't added the enzyme. No small one. Same length. The same primers amplified the same 18 nucleotides of mom's chromosome. Now, the same samples in the presence of the enzyme, the sample from dad, the sample from mom. What does dad's look like? So it's going to be smaller pieces of DNA two nine base pair pieces, which is going to go, it's going to be above or below the original bands. Below. below. It's smaller. It ran faster through the gel. What else might you do? This is not always true, by the way, of real PCR, but you could, and people, students answering these sorts of questions have in the past said, there are twice as many pieces of DNA that are nine base pairs long. You cut one 18 base pair piece of DNA in half, so you've got twice the number of molecules of DNA. So sometimes they've said, maybe that's a huge whopping blob of DNA. It's got twi there's twice as much DNA there on the gel. Okay. So that's a reasonable answer. Either of those would be fine. And then moms, even though we've added small one, we said it doesn't cut, so it migrates down the gel just like all the other 18 base pair products. The last thing about gel electrophoresis is we need to know the sizes of these pieces of DNA. And that's where that molecular weight ladder, MW, comes in. And that is a sample of DNA we add that's got pieces of DNA that we know what their sizes are. So that might be, for example, five base pairs, 10 base pairs, 25 base pairs. So we can estimate that that blob is somewhere between five and 10 base pairs large, and those bands are somewhere between 10 and 25. So that's gonna do it for agarose gel electrophoresis for now. Oh, and then there's this. I've got a minute left, so I can tell you all about this. 